with me through picturesque Tasmania, the island state of the Commonwealth, Hobart, the capital, nestling at the foot of the mighty Mount Wellington, with the brilliant blue water of the Derwent as a foreground, is a fitting introduction to its charm. A close inspection of the Derwent reveals a river harbour of many attractions, not least of them being its suitability for aquatic sports. Regattas on its wide stretches attract many thousands. But as a spectacle, sailing on the Derwent stands supreme. Quite apart from the idea of its recreation value or the thrills of the sport, you will agree that the sight of these yachts performing their graceful evolution is alluring. Then again, apart from the appeal of its beauty, it attracts by virtue of its suggestion of peace and calm. No rush or bustle here, no stormy seas. Just a lazy spectacle of boats being propelled by a soft breeze along unruffled waters whilst the sun throws its rays to add warmth to the colour. Leaving Hobart, we pass through the Derwent Valley, the road following the course of the river. The water is as clear and unmoved as a mill pond, and the reflection so vividly realistic that it might be a huge mirror. The trout hatcheries keep the rivers and lakes of Tasmania well stocked for anglers. On the road, still hugging the river, 25 miles from Hobart, we find ourselves looking down on the historic disk of New Norfolk, reposing peacefully in a setting of hop gardens and orchards. Hop picking is quite a family affair. And a tedious task is made easy by the mothers and children who make the scene one big playground. While father builds, well, he just brews Billy tea amid the hops. Tasmanian apples are famous. If an apple a day keeps the doctor away, he must find it hard to exist here. Our next stop is Russell Falls, situated on the fringe of a national park, a reservation of 40,000 acres. It is not their size or grandeur, but their delicate beauty that makes them famous. The water cascades some 200 feet over rocky ledges, whilst the sweet aroma of the wild shrubs and flowers intermingled with all types of ferns adds to the enchantment of the scene. The township of Ouse, 55 miles from Hobart, with its historic hotel erected nearly 100 years ago, is our next stop. The beautiful gardens surrounding it have been carved out of the virgin bush. Beyond the Ouse Valley and River is a large tract of magnificent mountain and lake country, comparatively unknown to the tourists prior to the opening of the West Coast Road in 1932. This road has not only opened up new fields for tourists, but has facilitated transport between the East and West. Crossing the Derwent once again, it is difficult to imagine the tiny stream of the same we viewed from Mount Wellington earlier. Four miles away to the north is Lake St. Clair. It is situated amid shapely mountains at the southern extremity of another national park. 200 square miles of wild country crammed full of thrilling haunts for those who crave adventure. Back on the main road, we pass its highest point at a spot known as King William Saddle. This blaze cutting, known as Hell's Gate, is the first of a series spread over six miles wherein the road drops some 2,000 feet. No camera could do justice to Surprise Valley. As far as the eye can see is a mantle of glorious greenery. For mile after mile, the road corkscrews its way round precipitous mountains and through passes. The memorial cairn will remind future generations of the foresight of those responsible for this engineering achievement. At every turn, the landscape changes. Around the next corner, a famous artist is attracted by the vivid colouring. Still another change of scene opens up as the road winds down through the canyon country, not unlike Colorado, approaching the Mount Lyle Mines. And right here before our eyes are the plant and ramifications of one of the world's richest copper mines. An inspection of this mine that has paid five million pounds in dividends is an educational treat. The management provides for visitors to view every phase of its vast operations.
Rome's seven hills are as nothing compared with those of Queenstown, the main centre of the district. Look at those hundred hills of pink and chocolate, cream and white. Just like a huge amphitheatre, the town is hemmed in on all sides by colourful eminences. A dazzling picture never to be forgotten. Our course from here is almost due north to Burnie. The narrow train track is carved into the mountainside and for many, many miles winds through magnificent forests consisting of mighty trees, ferns and other colourful flora. If you know of a more spectacular rail journey, you are to be envied. Overlooking Bass Strait, which separates the island from the mainland, we arrive in Burnie, the centre of a prosperous district producing various primary products. It possesses an excellent port providing accommodation for large steamers. These are protected from the stormy open seas by an immense breakwater recently erected. Large areas of valuable timber provide work for hardy axemen who have adopted the popular football slogan, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Watching these men, I blush to recall my own backyard efforts with the axe. Another important town of the northwest is Devonport on the Mersey, also possessing a fine port, accommodating steamers from the mainland. The rivers of Tasmania are all extremely pretty, especially the Meander, which flows through Deloraine, an English-looking town between Devonport and Launceston. The richly coloured surroundings reflected in the water rival those of the Derwent Valley, the angler's most popular resort is the Great Lake, 24 miles from Deloraine. 15 miles in length, it is a veritable angler's paradise, trout up to 25 pounds being caught. Spreading out before us here is Launceston, next in importance to Hobart. Charmingly laid out, it is located some 40 miles from the coast on the Tamer. Increasing manufacturers are responsible for recent development and have firmly established this city as the capital of the north. Most notable of the many scenic attractions is the Cataract Gorge. The tremendous onrush of water has pierced a passage through the Gibraltar-like rocks and makes its escape into the Tamer. There are many delightful walks along pathways cut in the face of the cliffs and among the profusion of tree ferns and native flora. For lovers of the ancient game, there's a delightful course at King's Meadows. The fairways remind one of rural England. Direct communication with Melbourne is maintained by fast and comfortable steamers, the trip down the river being a delightful experience, friends following by car in many instances to wave a last farewell. Pushing on in an easterly direction, we pass through Scottsdale, the centre of a rich dairying district. At Derby, further on, some valuable tin mines are to be seen, additional evidence of Tasmania's mineral wealth. Along the road to the east coast, beautiful fern glades appear at intervals. The first near view of the coast is gained from the upper inlet of George's River, where it meets the sea at George's Bay. St Helens is the next township. Good hotels provide for our comfort at each stop. And here we are treated to the unusual sight of wild pelicans enjoying the splendid fishing. The road travelling south affords periodical glimpses of the ocean and fresh river scenery along the proffer. An interesting spot is the Nally, where crayfish are caught in large numbers. The catch is very simple by means of basket-like snares. The unsuspecting crays attracted by the bait crawl into their doom. Once caught, they are taken ashore cooked, and then they are packed for export. Further south is Eagle Hawk Neck, a narrow strip of land connecting Tasman Peninsula, the centre of many interesting events in the early days of settlement. Curious rock formations abound. This remarkable feature known as the tessellated pavement is of particular interest. Then there is the Devil's Kitchen and the Blowhole. The old penal settlement of Port Arthur is one of the show places of Tasmania. 
in their setting of English oaks, the crumbled ruins of the old church and other buildings make one feel that this might indeed be England. They testify in silence to the grim happenings of a colourful past. The Isle of the Dead nearby is another skeleton from the cupboard of Australia's early history. Large steamers loading apples and other produce at the docks of Hobart remind us that our tour is nearly ended. At the ship's side, we say goodbye to friends. They promised to wave a last farewell to us from Mount Nelson, and they did. In Storm Bay, we pass the Barracuda fishing fleet and are treated to a final thrilling spectacle of three men in a boat to say nothing of the fish. This is not a fisherman's dream, but just an average catch in these parts. And as the land fades out of the picture, we are left with a multitude of vivid memories never to be forgotten of that romantic island, picturesque Tasmania. Mm -hmm.